Let me share with you one of my favorite patterns, and this really brings out the symmetry of the four top strings. So now let's take the seventh chord arpeggios on the four top strings, one finger per string, one finger per note, one note per string, starting with C major seventh rooted on the tenth fret of the fourth string. B minor seven flat five rooted on the ninth fret. Notice I'm going fourth finger, third finger, second, first. Always playing in both directions. A minor seventh rooted on the seventh fret. Now this fingering, fourth finger, second, third, first. So you kind of turn a corner there. Then G dominant seventh. Fourth finger, third, second, first. There's a stretch there. And finally, F major seventh. And you have a set of chords, F major seven, G dominant seventh, A minor seven, B minor seven flat five, C major seventh, which form a symmetrical pattern, which is very easy to keep in your head. Now we can take those chords and of course move them into different keys. Take those arpeggios and move them to different keys very easily. But we want to think of like where the center is all the time. And the center happens to be a sixth chord, the minor seventh chord that's rooted in the sixth of the key. And we're going to move that up a whole step. So it's going to be B minor seven. And that puts us in the key of D. So if we're in the key of D, then our tonic chord it's going to be D rooted on the 12th fret of the fourth string and our our four chord is going to be G major seventh rooted on the fifth fret of that string so now how do I know automatically where those two chords are I go to the middle and I start with the middle of the middle that sixth chord just like with the A minor 7th, A, C, E, G, every chord that is rooted on the 6th of the key, every minor 7th chord rooted on the 6th of the key has the tonic 3rd in its center. So if you know where that is, the center of that chord, that's the tonic of the key. That's interval number 1 in the key. So the key of D begins here on the seventh fret between the second and third strings and it radiates out from there once i have that well th where my first finger is now my fourth finger is going to go there and i have the four chord where my fourth finger is here my first finger goes to that fret position although on the first string but it's the same fret position so i've got my my one chord my sixth chord and my four chord. One, D major seven, one. First finger becomes the fourth finger on the fourth string. B minor seven, six. My first finger now in this arpeggio becomes the fret position of the fourth finger of the four chord. And in between, we have our dominant seventh chord on one side of the center, and we have our minor seven flat five on the other side of the center. And you may notice that the minor seven flat five, which has a stretch between the root and the third, followed by consecutive fret positions, is exactly a rotationally opposite 180 degrees rotated version of a dominant seventh chord which has the stretch between the two highest notes between the fifth and the seventh whereas this has a stretch 
between the root and the third. So once you've established these positions in one key, of course you can navigate between from one key to another to another in a way that gives you a clear picture of how the notes in that key are structured. So you can find your way around. You need to have identifiable landmarks. In every diatonic key, there are a set of landmarks based on the simple interval of a third. Since most of our harmonic structure is going to be based on thirds, if you take the two strings that are in fact tuned a third apart from each other, then you have uh, the center of the harmonic system on the fingerboard. Using the second and third string interval of a third as the starting point. So I'm going to simplify the terminology a little bit and instead of referring to the second and third string as the second and third string or the third and second string or the G and the B string or the B and the G string, I'm going to simplify the terminology a little bit and calling anything that happens between the G string and the B string in either direction in any fret position as being the third rail, being on the third rail, or crossing the third rail, or being above or below the third rail. The third rail is the G and the B string together, and whatever happens when you combine them. And you play on the fifth fret on the third rail, then you are playing a C major third. And if you're in the key of C, that C major third is the one. If you are still in the key of C and you play the open strings, those open strings are five, as is the 12th fret, five. The 10th fret is four, the fifth fret is one, the open strings are five. One, four, five, five, back to one. One, 10th fret four, 12th fret five, open strings five, and then back to one. That's the key of C, and those are the major thirds in the key of C. That's it. Those are the major thirds in the key of C. On the third rail, what could be easier? Both notes on the same fret position, open strings, fifth fret, tenth fret, twelfth fret. And, you know, we're going to make it even simpler and get rid of the twelfth fret because we don't need to have the five happen twice. There's nothing special about it that means the five gets to happen twice. We'll just have one of each. The one, the four, and the five in the key of C. What happens in between the one, the four, and the five? Well, there are no more major thirds, so all we have left is minor thirds. And it's interesting because in every major key, there are three major thirds and four minor thirds. Four minor thirds. So we have the five as the open strings, six, seven, one. One, seven, six, five. Five, six, seven, one. Those are our minor thirds, six and seven, in between the five and the one. And then when we go from the one to the four, of course we have two and three. So we've got one, two, three, four, three, two, one. Now, I want to do this not as a scale, but as groupings that, again, bring out the symmetry of the system. If we start on one and we go up to four, one, two, three, four, three, two, one, we have the major third at one end, the major third at the other end, two minor thirds in between. Now those minor thirds fill up the four fret spaces that lie in between the one and the four. Notice that the one and the four are one, two, three, four, five, six fret spaces apart if you include, count inclusively, include the space the, that the one is on and include the space that the four is on. In other words, the fifth fret and the tenth fret. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Six spaces. We are not adding, we are not subtracting, we are counting. And uh, I find this especially effective if you're moving around the fingerboard and you want to describe to yourself how many frets you have to go from one note to another to, to count the fret spaces inclusively. 
If I'm on the fifth fret and I'm going to the seventh fret, I'm, sp I'm spanning three frets, five, six, seven. I'm not going to omit the fret that I start on from the count. Just as you don't omit the root note when you count thirds and you go root, second, third, it's a third because you count all three of those notes, all three of those alphabet letters. Here, I'm counting the fifth fret, I'm counting the sixth fret, and I'm counting the seventh fret as part of the distance. That is a three fret span. So if I'm going from the fifth to the seventh fret, I'm spanning three frets. You could say, yeah, I'm going up two. I'm spanning three. Okay, <laughs> spanning six frets to go from the fifth fret to the tenth fret. It's a six fret span. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? And there are four spaces in between. We're going to fill those spaces with two minor thirds. The uh, D minor third, E minor third. On either end, we have the one and the four. Well, the same thing is going to happen between the one and the open position, the G, where we have four empty spaces, one, two, three, first fret, second, third, and fourth. The open strings are one end of the sixth fret span. The fifth fret is another end of the sixth fret span. And it's kind of funny saying a sixth fret span from the open strings to the fifth fret. Of course, the open strings are zero. It's the one time we have the, a zero in music is when we're talking about the open strings. Otherwise, there is no zero. Keep in mind that intervals do not have a zero. There is no zero note. There's only one. Every note you play is one if you, until you decide otherwise. You go from that note to the next note to the next note. Theoretically, the note, every note you play is note number one every time. Let's not uh, go too deep into that right now. I'm getting off the subject. Anyway. <laughs> Five, six, seven, one. One, two, three, four, three, two, one, seven, six, five. If you have a major third on the third rail, you also have an axis every single time. Anytime you have a major third between the second and third strings, you have a fret position where there is a note belonging to the key on each string in that fret position. And it will be very predictable. If you are playing the one, the tonic, the third that the key is rooted in, you will have six, the six above and below, the minor tonic. In other words, a minor third down from the one, from the third string note. So if you take that third string note, in this case C, C, B, A, above and below major tonic third minor tonic when we get to the four F major third F major in the key of C is the four four three two is above and below it so we have an F major third and then we have D below and above when we get to the open strings of course we have G major that's the five and we have E above and below it is simply the three Every key works the same way. So let's say we go halfway around the globe of the planet guitar, and we find ourselves in the key of G. Well, in the key of G, where is the tonic? It's the open strings and the 12th fret. So the axis position, along with that major third, is going to give you the sixth of the key. Of course, the open E string is now a six because it is the key of G and E is the six of G. Where is the four and the five on the third rail? C major is four, D major is five in the key of G, and of course in the four we have the two underneath and above. When we get to the five we have the three above and below, below and above. So the four, five, one. The third rail is the starting point for all of this, not the sixth string, not the first string, the third rail. Why? Because you can go in both directions from there to some degree. Of course, you can only go from the second string up to the first string, and you can only go, well, you can go a lot further coming down from there. But if we start there, we have a template 
for the way the system works, and that's really important. The template for the way the system works, which is found in the four top strings, is really by far, as far as I'm concerned, the simplest way and the clearest way to understand how the diatonic system works on the guitar and to understand how key structure works on the guitar. Now that we've established where the major thirds are in the key of G, let's look for those minor thirds. Remember, there were three major thirds in every key. So in the key of G, we have a G major, a C major, and a D major. The minor thirds fall in between those major third axis positions, just as they did in the key of C. In this case, we start with A minor on the first and second frets, and B minor on the third and fourth frets, right in between the open strings and the fifth fret. Continuing from there, we have an axis on the seventh fret, which serves as the five, that's D major on the seventh fret. And we have, of course, an axis on the twelfth fret, which is the one again, an octave above the open strings. And in between those two axis positions, we have our six and our seven, E minor, F sharp minor. So if we know where that is, we can just, well, let's just play only the minor third. So you can see how identifying these positions based partly on their geometric structure, but also understanding the theory behind that geometry. The geometry of the notes on the fretboard is an expression of the diatonic system itself. It's not just an arbitrary set of shapes. The key of C and the key of G have distinctly different organizations on the fingerboard, but their structure is the same, theoretically. What this amounts to is that there are certain elements which are unchanging as you go from one key to another, but they might be juxtaposed in a different geometric relationship to each other depending upon what key you're in. So in the key of C, the void position is at the 11th fret. In the key of G, the void position is on the 6th fret. And in every key, that position will be in a different place. And the axes will be in a different place. But all of those elements will always have the same relationship to each other. The relationship of the axis positions and the relationship of the major thirds and minor thirds to each other in their respective key degrees does not change when you go from one key to another. If you have this structure that goes one, two, three, four, it is the same as the structure that goes five, six, seven, one. Can you visualize the patterns can you see them in your mind? Are you able to encapsulate the idea of a major third and a minor third on the third rail, crossing the second and third strings? Now, at the beginning of this video, we looked at some seventh chord arpeggios, which we later discovered were aligned along the third rail. And using the third rail as the starting point, we can identify and place those seventh arpeggios not thinking root note first, but from the center of the arpeggio up and down. And of course, we can take this into the key of G from the key of C and notice that the void position is now at the center of the pattern. And the same arpeggios are there, but the arrangement of those arpeggios is distinctly different. Look at each one carefully and identify it and see if you can play it 
in its position in the key of G. Then return to the key of C, find the same set of arpeggios, play them up and down, and visualize the key as you play. Think about where you are in the key all the time. This is just one of many ways to visualize the notes of every key on the fingerboard, every diatonic key. Primarily, we're concerned with major keys at the moment. Minor keys present a few other complications that aren't accounted for by the basic symmetry of the major key that we're examining here. Separating the four top strings from the lower pitch strings is a way of really emphasizing the symmetry by placing the third rail at the center of that group. And that goes back actually to the earliest guitars which had four or five strings. The four string guitar which was tuned basically the way a ukulele is tuned now. Of course the ukulele is really a small guitar with four strings and the four top strings of the guitar are the original tuning of the instrument. So taking the four top strings of the guitar and focusing on that as the starting point for developing your understanding of the fingerboard really is quite historical. Symmetry on the fingerboard may seem like a strange idea, but it actually really goes back a long way. to thank everybody who's liked and subscribed to my channel and uh, if you have any questions at all or anything is confusing about this video please say so in the comments below and I'd be glad to clarify anything that uh, you have any questions about and I will see you next time thanks mm -hmm.